Pain on the outside part of the hip was previously diagnosed as greater trochanteric bursitis. However, it actually appears to be a gluteal tendinopathy, meaning that the loads placed on the hip have exceeded what it can tolerate. But what does strength actually have to do with gluteal tendinopathy, and what are the impacts for rehab? So this study here looked at glute strength in those with gluteal tendinopathy compared to a control group. And what they found is that those with gluteal tendinopathy had a decreased force production in the hip compared to that control group. Additionally, what they found was that in the non-symptomatic leg of those with gluteal tendinopathy, they also had reduced force production compared to the control group. So what this means is that overall, we have decreased force production in the symptomatic leg and the asymptomatic leg in those with gluteal tendinopathy. So when it comes to rehab, we should probably be strengthening both sides because we see a decreased force production. We can also compare the loads placed on the hip with walking and then potentially with running as well. In this study, what they found was that during walking, the gluteal tendinopathy group had increased loads placed on the hip compared to a control group. And if we pair up those two studies, in those with gluteal tendinopathy, we have decreased force production on both sides. We also have increased loads with walking and then also potentially running as well. And that's basically a recipe for overload. We have increased loads at the hip and we have decreased capacity to tolerate those loads. So it makes sense that for those with gluteal tendinopathy that we'd want to strengthen the hips. But when looking at severity of pain and function, we actually don't see that strength is related. And what that means is that the weaker the glutes doesn't mean the more pain and the worse function we have. Instead, we see things like pain catastrophizing, which means that the pain that we're experiencing is being magnified, poor pain self-efficacy, meaning that we're not able to control the pain that we're experiencing, increased levels of depression, lower rating of quality of life, and increased BMI as things that are related to the severity of pain as well as function. And this might sound kind of bad, but when we look at pain, we know that it's influenced by a ton of different factors. In fact, we call it the biopsychosocial model of pain, meaning that we have biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors that all contribute to pain, even though we typically only focus on the biological factors. And this makes a lot of sense when we look at the LEAP study, which was a study on gluteal tendinopathy, which compared an education plus exercise group to a corticosteroid injection group, and then a wait and see group. And what they found was that the education plus exercise group had better results when looking at global ratings of change as well as pain compared to the other groups. Interestingly, in this study, what they found is that the education plus exercise group, there wasn't improvements in strength at eight weeks, even though there was improvement in pain, which means that there are potentially other mechanisms of how exercise helps those with gluteal tendinopathy besides just strengthening the muscles. So when we look at things like pain catastrophizing or pain self-efficacy, or even depression, we know education and exercise can actually help with those things. So what does this mean for rehab and treatment of gluteal tendinopathy? Well, I think one thing is that we don't necessarily have to chase strength. Obviously, strength in the glute muscles can be beneficial, but this doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to lead to improvements in pain or function. When picking exercises, for example, we can look for exercises that help to decrease pain catastrophizing as well as improve our confidence with those movements. So we can look for exercises that help to decrease the pain or modify them so that, that way we're able to do them. We can start with the sideline leg raise where the focus is on that top leg. Lifting the leg up towards the ceiling brings it into hip abduction and then bringing it down towards the floor brings it into hip adduction which is going to increase the compressive loads. Once we're able to tolerate that, then we can progress to a side bridge where we're increasing the compressive loads as well as the range of motion at the hip. Another example is if there's pain with walking. We can do a modified mountain climber where we're just sliding our legs, so we're mimicking the movement of walking, so we're getting the body used to those ranges of motion on the hip. And then we can progress this to a carry or something like that where we're marching in place with a weight on one side, either a kettlebell or a backpack or some sort of weight, so that we're just increasing the load to get the body used to those ranges of motion while giving it a different input. While all these exercises look like strengthening exercises, and to an extent they definitely are, what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to mimic some of the ranges of motions that are painful, but do them so that they're not painful so that we can get better at those movements. And when looking at some of those other factors like depression, quality of life, or BMI, we aren't limited to just exercises that specifically target the hip. We can pick exercises that we enjoy to do and they can help address some of those factors as well as potentially helping with gluteal tendinopathy. In fact, this large research study published in The Lancet found that physical activity was associated with decreased mental health burden. Participating in team sports, cycling, going to the gym can all be useful approaches to address some of these factors and gluteal tendinopathy. 
Overall, exercise can be helpful for gluteal tendinopathy, and specifically strengthening the glutes can be beneficial, but it's probably not the only exercise approach that's helpful. Additionally, there's other factors to consider than purely just strength when looking at the treatment of gluteal tendinopathy. So hopefully this video on strength and gluteal tendinopathy was helpful. If it was, go ahead and give this video a big thumbs up. If you want to see more of my content, I'll put the subscribe button over here. I'll also put another video on that LEAP study so you can see the exercises for gluteal tendinopathy. I'll see you in the next video.